in preventable diseases and immunization, realizing the full potential of the European Vaccine Action Plan 2015-2020. We will continue with the deliberations of item 5. The relevant document is EUR slash RC 68 slash 9. The European Vaccine Action Plan 2015-2020 was adopted by the Regional Committee in September 2014. A mid-term review of European Vaccine Action Plan was carried out by the Regional Office and the final report of the review in its entirety submitted to the Regional Committee as an information document. The mid-term review highlights the achievements made in our region from 2015 to 2017, and it identifies further efforts that will be required to maintain the momentum and leverage the full potential of the Vaccine Action Plan. Let us first look at a short video, A Voice of Our Region. Mein Name ist äh, Katrin, ich bin 33, mein Mann ist 40. Wir haben eine dreijährige Tochter und erwarten im September unsere zweite Tochter. Das ist die Emma. Ich mache mir große Sorgen, weil in den letzten Jahren hat es sehr viele Masernfälle gegeben. Um Emma mache ich mir keine Sorgen. Sie hat eine vollständige Masernimpfung erhalten. Ähm und ist demnach ja geschützt. Ich mache mir mehr Sorgen darum, dass unser, Unge unser Baby, wenn es dann auf der Welt ist, sich bei anderen Kindern an anstecken kann mit den Masern, da viele nicht impfen. Es hat einen Todesfall in Berlin gegeben, da ist ein kleiner Junge an Masern verstorben. Da macht man, mache ich mir als Mutter natürlich meine, meine Gedanken. Mein ungeborenes Kind, sobald es auf der Welt ist, kann sich anstecken. Man darf ja erst ab einem Jahr impfen. Ich habe äh, sowohl Impfgegner als auch ja, Impfbefürworter im Freundeskreis. Ähm, ich bin, als ich mit meiner ersten Tochter schwanger war, gefragt worden, ob ich mein Kind impfen werde. Und für mich war diese Frage irgendwie... Das war für mich keine Frage. Mir war klar, ich impfe mein Kind. Für mich war eher die Frage, warum impfst du dein Kind nicht? Ist für mich völlig äh, unverständlich. Auf der anderen Seite habe ich äh, eine Freundin, die äh, leider ihr Kind in der 25. Schwangerschaftswoche geboren hat. Also eine sehr starke Frühgeburt. Wäre die mit ungeimpften Kindern in Kontakt gekommen, das wäre für sie wirklich ja, im schlimmsten Fall mit Sicherheit tödlich verlaufen. In Deutschland ist es, äh, ist es so, dass wenn äh, ich mein Kind im Kindergarten anmelde, dass ich äh, ganz zu Beginn äh, den, äh, das U-Heft, also das äh, gelbe Untersuchungsheft, vorzeigen muss und äh, dem Dabei liegt ja immer der Impfausweis. Wenn ich mich aus welchen Gründen auch immer dazu entschieden hätte, mein Kind nicht zu impfen, müsste ich einen Nachweis vorlegen, dass ein Gespräch mit dem Arzt stattgefunden hat, dass der Arzt mich ausreichend über Impfen und äh, die Konsequenzen des Nichtimpfens äh, informiert hat. Ich äh, bin immer ganz froh darum, wenn ich weiß, dass die Kinder, mit denen meine Tochter spielt oder später auch mit denen mein Baby in Kontakt kommt, bin ich schon ganz froh zu wissen, dass die geimpft sind. Was hast du gemeint? Wir hatten in Deutschland eigentlich eine ganz gute Immunisierung. Wenn man dann die Zahlen sieht, dass wir in manchen Teilen bei 80 Prozent sind, das schockiert mich schon. Aber es gibt viele Kinder, die können aus verschiedensten Gründen nicht geimpft werden oder sind nicht geimpft und die müssen auch geschützt werden. Und das geht nur durch, dadurch, dass alle am selben Strang ziehen. Ja, ich denke, es ist äh, unglaublich wichtig, dass wir diese äh, 95 Prozent Herdenimmunität in Deutschland schaffen äh, oder dass, dass die da ist, weil ich nicht alleine in der Lage bin, mein Kind, wenn es auf der Welt ist, zu schützen. Da muss irgendwie das ganze System mithelfen. Ich kann das nicht alleine schaffen, mein Kind zu schützen. Es braucht dafür die ganze Gesellschaft. 
eine bessere Gesundheit für alle. Okay. After this very inspiring video, I invite Dr. Nedret Emiroglu, Director of Program Management and Emergency and Communicable Diseases, to introduce this agenda item. Nedret, please. Thank you very much, President. First of all, I would like to thank the Standing Committee for the Regional Committee of, and European Member States who would like to bring this important agenda item today uh, at, a, at a very important juncture because, I'm sorry, I need to go back. Okay, uh, as you will remember by adopting the European Vaccine Action Plan in 2014, actually all member states made a huge pledge and commitment towards the immunization, which is one of the best public health interventions and investments that someone could have, either individually or at the national level. And equitable provision of immunization services are very much in line with the whole spirit of a strong prevention health promotion, sustainable development goals, European uh, framework for health 2020, as well as the, within the spirit of uh, general program of work 13. So implementation of the European Vaccine Action Plan has been ongoing since 2014 with the leadership of course with by the member states but in full engagement of all the partners and including the communities and civil society. One thing we very surely know is the political commitment and strengthened partnership at all levels, national, but also at the local level, with regional, international organizations, civil society, communities, is vital to be able to engage the communities to be vaccinated. So we are happy to provide you a feedback on this midterm review of the uh, European Vaccine Action Plan, and I'm grateful to the European Technical Advisory Group of Experts, and, and we are grateful for the Chair to be here with us, who is going to be addressing soon, for their oversight in the midterm report and providing also the recommendations for further actions. So very, very shortly, I want to walk you through, through the EVAP goals and where we are with the, with the goals. And in the next few slides, I will provide you where we are on the three of those that we are on track out of the six goals in the vaccine action plan. And one is still goal pending validation, which is also likely to be on track. So if you go and, and look into the ones on, on track, the good news is that the region sustained this polio-free status. Of course, there's, there are still countries who are having some high, medium, and low risk for continued transmission in case of a uh, importation. But also, we are at a juncture where the containment of polio viruses, especially in the European context, is critical. Uh, in 2015, the Regional uh, Committee endorsed the Viral Hepatitis Action Plan, which of course includes the Hepatitis B control targets. The regional process to validate the, process, uh, the, the Hepatitis B status has been initiated, so we could say that this is on track, but there is some more work to be done. And in 80% in of our member states, the national immunization technical advisory groups are uh, functional, at, uh, playing a crucial role and making recommendations on the vaccination schedules or new vaccine introduction, so making uh, evidence-based policies. And now 94% of our member states, which to be concrete, 50 out of 53, have financing uh, their routine vaccines 
using the domestic funding, which is a huge uh, improvement within the region. And all these uh, achievements have been tremendously showing the national ownership and the commitment. So I'm continuing with the good news uh, on, on the measles and rubella elimination, uh, which is showing the dem uh, changes and progress since 2014. You see in the first part on the number of countries who, who are achieving the measles elimination status, and the second one is on the rubella elimination. Uh, 21 from 21 in 2014, now 37 countries in 2017 eliminated measles, which means free of uh, any measles cases for three years. And if we look into interruption of transmission, which is 11 months of no measles cases, this is 43 member states achieving that status. So on one hand, we have the good news, uh, where we have a huge progress in, in measles and rubella elimination, but I will come back on what the major challenges are. And, and most of these challenges are related to the immunization coverage rates. Because if you look at the national or regional averages, we don't see much change. It is stagnating or sometimes increasing, decreasing a bit. But what is important is the coverage at the subnational level. So the, the uh, concern we are having is the, the region is at risk of not achieving coverage targets of 95%, which is, uh, which is the, at the subnational level as well. And as in this slide you see, there's a number of countries now, unfortunately, with the increasing number of districts which are achieving low coverage, which forms the basis of outbreaks with the accumulated immunity gaps that really create a platform where the outbreaks occur, as was the case in the measles. Now, within these a uh, couple of maps, I'm going to walk you where we are with the measles epidemiology. This is the situation in 2016, and as a matter of principle, the, the darker the color you see, the higher the number of cases. And uh, this was the year where we had the lowest cases of uh, measles in the region, about 5,000. And in 2017, we alerted the countries with multiple outbreaks of an increasing trend. As you see, more countries are becoming red, about 23,000, 24,000 cases. And unfortunately, as you heard from the regional director, during the first six months of 2018, we have a record number of 41,000 cases. And actually, 86 small and large, combination of small and large measles outbreaks within the whole region, which is totally unacceptable and preventable. So if you look at the, the results behind this, and, and uh, I would like to walk you through here what are the reasons in, in having all these immunity gap and the outbreaks, actually they are multiple and they are context specific which means all these have to be analyzed separately also at the local level, and all these barriers should be addressed uh, in order to be able to increase the immunization coverage and address the immunity gap within the region. So the, some are related to the national structures in terms of vaccine shortages in some countries, and also inability to offer the benefits of the new vaccines in some of the middle-income countries. That's one of the reasons, a group of reasons as of concern. Then another big, big area is the vaccine hesitancy, which is also increasing and receiving much attention in the region, especially in the wake of the large measles outbreaks. And the nature and impact of vaccine hesitancy is different, and the reasons behind that is different, which is requiring a local analysis and local actions. And the most important uh, factor here is the 
strong information towards the benefits of immunization to those who uh, kind of uh, being scared of the risk. So in co conclusion, the uh, midterm report provides some concrete actions and recommendations to the, to the countries to be able to address these immunity gaps. So public uh, trust and creating demand is one of the major factors within those recommendations. Of course, that requires the strongest political commitment, which is essential together with the required resources. Then we, we, we emphasize the role of healthcare professionals, which is essential in each and every immunization service delivery at all levels. High quality immunization data is another area where it's critical for local decision making. And, and I want to also highlight that influenza, that we, we see a huge low coverage within the region, which requires a different and a new thinking of vaccination within the benefits throughout the life course. And finally, uh, I would like to conclude saying that immunization is a shared responsibility of all of us. Good health for every individual starts with vaccination and we all stand committed to realize its full potential. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nedret. I will now give the floor to Professor Adam Finn, Chair of the European Technical Advisory Group of Experts. Thank you. Uh, esteemed colleagues, good afternoon. I am a practicing clinician. I qualified in 1983, and as a junior doctor, I used to diagnose and treat serious infections in young children, which my trainees today no longer see and might struggle to recognize. Measles, bacterial meningitis caused by haemophilus, and whooping cough, to name but a few. These recent changes represent vast achievements in the prevention of human suffering and the saving of health financial resources. They are a testament to the success of governmental policies, the work of countless health professionals, and the tireless efforts of my colleagues at the WHO Regional Office in Europe, who've done so much to inform and encourage the development and implementation of effective vaccine programs in member states throughout our region. But these successes as well as the alarming spectre in our region of the recent rises in vaccine-preventable infections, most notably measles, highlight the Achilles heel of vaccination, the weak spot, the vulnerability. Vaccines can be a victim of their own success. As a child, I, and maybe some of you, had measles and whooping cough. As a young doctor, I treated them but the doctors and parents of today have never seen them. The politicians of today have other pressing problems and priorities. We forget these past plagues at our peril. They can and they do return to kill our children if we drop our guard. The current problems you just heard about with measles control do not simply reflect today's immunization rates. The cause goes back over many years. While vaccines enjoy levels of public support that elected politicians can only dream of, 60, 70, 80, more than 90% uptake in some places, this is simply not enough. Even if every year only 10% of children do not receive their two doses of measles vaccine, the number of unprotected individuals steadily grows until outbreaks become inevitable as soon as the virus is re-imported by a homecoming traveler. People think they have their children vaccinated so that those same children will not get sick but that is only half the story. 
Vaccines do not simply protect the individuals who receive them, but also by halting the spread of infections, they protect many others as well. Those too sick to receive them. Those immunized many years before whose immunity has waned. Those who never showed up at the clinic. Those misled by scare stories and conspiracy theories. We all must work to protect our children and our entire populations by securing and delivering effective universal vaccine programs. We must protect everyone against the harms of preventable infection and the harms of misinformation, misunderstanding and complacency. Many of us in this room today would not be here were it not for vaccines. We would have died in childhood and our parents would have had more children to replace us. That was the reality of parenthood before vaccines. But we do not know that we were saved. Our parents' eyes never witnessed that disaster. The challenges we now face in grasping our new reality, the reality of a freedom from children killed or maimed by polio, meningitis or measles, and the infections that follow them, the reality of protection as adults against cancers of the liver and cervix caused by infections that we can prevent. These challenges are real and present. So today, let us congratulate ourselves on what has been achieved, but please, let us fully recognize how much remains to be done. Thank you. Thank you very much. I shall now open the debate and I request delegates wishing to speak on the issues raised under this item, please to raise their name plates. But please take in mind that at one o'clock we have to stop. So I will give the floor, let, let's see who is willing to take the floor, all the auditorium, okay. And, uh, uh, okay. And uh, so we will manage it. We will uh, give the floor until one o'clock, and then we shall see. So I give the floor to Serbia, followed by Greece. Serbia, please. Thank you very much, uh, Your Excellencies, Director General, dear colleagues. Uh, it's my pleasure on behalf of Serbia to inform you in brief that the uh, Ministry of Health and the Institute of Public Health of the Republic of Serbia, together with WHO support, set the grounds to tackle the low coverage rate of immunized children, as well as to adequately respond to the measles outbreak in 2017 and 2018. WHO tailored immunization program already resulted in development of a country tailored comprehensive set of trainings for the health care workers and uh, info sheet for the parents. The updated national immunization program was also adopted in December last year, introducing several new vaccines as obligatory or recommended and we made MMR immunization also mandatory for all employees in healthcare institutions who were born after 1971, as we observed high number of infected health professionals during this outbreak. Due to joint effort of the Ministry of Health, Institute of Public Health and WHO, the immunization coverage is much better comparing on 2017, but still is under 95% of national level. Thus, we appreciate ongoing WHO support as we can focus on development of a comprehensive response for the measles outbreak with the National Action Plan on Vaccination, as well as launching a national vaccination awareness campaign among the general population. The whole uh, Euro region, especially our countries in the southern eastern Europe, faces challenges due to anti-vaccination lobby 
the strong support from WHO is needed on bringing evidence for population and healthcare professionals on benefits of the vaccines. While the vaccine's procurement is fully financed from our national budget and, and is still a yearly basis, Serbia, as other countries in the region, faces the difficulties and challenges during this process. Serbia is a small market, as you know, and sometimes pharmaceutical companies do not have an interest to register all products and to offer price reductions. Joint procurement of the vaccines could be a possible solution for all for reduces prices and secured provision of the vaccine in all countries. But also, we have to see how to revise this procedure in case the emergency and WHO support is needed in this regard. When we are speaking about info from the field at the moment, from October 2017, when the epidemic started, as of September this year, a total of uh, 2,755 cases have been registered. Different birth cohort has been affected, including adolescents and adults. The youngest registered case in, is a, a 15 days old baby, and the oldest is seven one years old. The majority of patients fall under the age group of below five years old, as well as 13 years old and above. The majority of patients, 95%, are not vaccinated, incompletely vaccinated, or with unknown vaccine status. Out of the total number of patients, 33 were or are still hospitalized. Of the severe cases, pneumonia was reported in 254 cases and also two cases of encephalitis so far. Thank you very much. Thank you, Serbia. I now give the floor to, Gle to Greece, followed by Romania. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Mrs. Uh, Regional Director, Dr. Regional Director, distinguished participants. Of course, there is uh, a lot of progress made since the launch of the um, European Vaccination Plan, vac uh, Vaccine Action Plan, since uh, 2014. But a lot remains to be done, uh, especially uh, within the challenge imposed by the measles outbreak uh, uh, in front of us. Greece, as a member state of the WHO European region, is fully committed to implement the European Vaccine Action Plan. By decision of the Ministry of Health, the National Immunization Committee is the body of the Ministry of Health responsible for advising on recommended vaccines and the Ministry of Health issues the National Immunization Program. Vaccines included in the National Vaccination Program are simply but strongly recommended, and in accordance with current legislation, sanctions are not imposed on those who do not want to get vaccinated. Enrollment of pupils in kindergarten and primary school requires vaccination with vaccines provided in the National Vaccination Program, Therefore, vaccination of children is becoming, in a sense, mandatory, <coughs> yet adult vaccination remains just recommended. There is no dedicated official responsibility for call and follow-up for those who have not been vaccinated against vaccine-preventable disease. The vaccine and the vaccination performed are being recorded in the personal child health booklet in writing, but Again, a centralized vaccine registry is more than ever required. Vaccination coverage of children in Greece for vaccine-preventable diseases is, maintain, is maintained at high percentages. However, there are vulnerable social groups, such as the Roma uh, communities, who have a low level of vaccination coverage, and this created concerns during the recent measles outbreak especially in Greece, addresses the health needs of refugees and asylum seekers. Uh, the comprehensive sustained effort was undertaken for their vaccination within the vaccines of measles, rubella, mumps, diphtheria, tetanus, pertussis, and polio, and newborns with tuberculosis vaccines. The above recommendations are updated depending on the epidemiological data and the availability of vaccines. Vaccines included in the National Immunization Program are provided free of charge to all legal residents in the country, whether insured or not, including asylum applicants. 
Vaccines are covered through the Greek National Health Service Organization and by extension through the state budget. The free provision of the vaccines included in the national immunization program is a major facilitator of vaccination coverage in Greece. Moreover, vaccine hesitancy encompasses a delay in acceptance of new vaccines or their refusal despite the availability of immunization services through national initiatives. Hesitancy to adopt new vaccines is multifaceted, multifaceted with uh, variations between time, place, and vaccines, whilst being formed from concerns around compl complacency, convenience, and confidence. I thank you. Thank you, Grish. We shall now break for lunch. Uh, no, we can, we can listen to Romania. Romania, please. Thank you, Professor Bazokos. Uh, uh, Balkan region is very well uh, represented in this. Uh, yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, Madam Regional Director, Mr. President, Executive President, Deputy Executive President, distinguished delegates and experts. Vaccination has been extraordinarily successful in reducing the burden of vaccine preventable diseases and has prevented millions of deaths. The successes we have noted in the midterm review of the European vac Vaccine Action Plan demonstrate both the impact and further potential of vaccination to protect health. Romania stands committed in achieving and sustaining the goals of European Vaccine Action Plan. As Romania prepares to take over the EU Council Presidency in January 2019, the Romanian Ministry of Health will ensure that vaccination and its benefit remains a priority at national and EU, le EU level preventive public health programs. A special expert meeting will be organized in May 2019 during the Romanian presidency where representative or uh, European, uh, uh, European Union countries, but also other countries from Europe will be invited to highlight challenges and solutions in order to achieve European vac vaccine action plan. Romania has experienced a large MIRSAS outbreak, as you saw earlier that started in January 2016, which includes an, uh, 59 measles-related deaths. It is a stark reminder that gaps in coverage that exist in our communities, it is our responsibility to keep every community safe from vaccine-preventable diseases through high vaccination coverage and a repeat response to any importation of these diseases to limit their spread. The Ministry of Health of Romania is hardly working with partners to address immunization gaps and to stop missiles virus transmission. In enhancing population trust in vaccine and in vaccination is essential to reach these goals. We would like to thank the regional director uh, and WHO regional office for the constant and highly qualified technical support and guidance provided in this area. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Romania. The list of the countries that want to speak is Poland, Monaco, Lithuania, Russian Federation, Germany, Slovakia, Tajikistan, former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia, Turkey, Ukraine, Belgium, Bulgaria, Hungary, France, and the Republic of Moldova. I have told you. Now I think uh, we can close the list because we have uh, some observers that also want to speak. We break for lunch and I should like to remind...